Second Kings, if you have your Bible, Second Kings tonight, chapter number two. If you have your Bible, we're looking at Elisha tonight. And verse number 19. Trying to get more into the 21st century and do some of my notes on this uh, electronic device so then I'll have them and not lose them. And so if you see me trying to stare at this phone, I'm tr not trying to make a phone call or, or buy something on eBay. I'm trying to look at my notes, if, just if you're wondering. Uh, 2 Kings chapter number 2, verse number 19. <clears throat> the Bible says, And the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of the city is pleasant, as my Lord seeth, but the water is not, and the ground barren. He said, Bring me a new cruise, and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. And he went forth unto the spring of the waters, and cast the salt in there, and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake. Let's be seated. We'll bow to pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the night. Thank you for this uh, account of your prophet. You recorded these things for our learning and our admonition. <clears throat> I'm not hoping not to try to read too much into this passage, but just to use it and allow it to use, be used in our hearts and lives tonight. We thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for uh, the ability to trust you in the miracles that you bring forth from your hand in our lives. Father, we're a needy people. We need you tonight. I need you for wisdom. I need you for worship. And I need you for the work ahead. And I pray that you'd bless our gathering and, and the people that uh, you've brought to this body. And I pray that you would add others to the body so we could not uh, become bigger, but we could become better and reach out and do even more ministry. Thankful for ideas and, and heart uh, felt uh, burdens for ministry and just excited about those opportunities. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you <clears throat> filled out that paper for the courtside ministries, they're starting July uh, on a Tuesday, I believe, and so I'm going to get those papers turned in that I've got so far, but if you uh, had an application or like one, uh, just to remind you what that is, it's just setting up a table and praying with people who might come in for a court hearing or have a, have a, a, a date in front of the lawyer or in front of the judge and just offer prayer and see if that opens up a door for more ministry. I was talking to a fellow this morning who said, well, I'd like to just have something at, at the Marysville um, a food market or farm market. We could have a table. I'm like, yeah, let's, let's figure it out. I mean, if you've got a burden to reach people and, and, and have <clears throat> some idea, as long as you're willing to work the idea, I, I, I don't need more work to do, but I love more ideas for everybody else to do. Amen? Sometimes people say, Preacher, i got the greatest idea for you to do. I'm like, thank you very much. I love it. I'd love for you to carry it out. And, and I've got plenty of ideas I haven't carried out myself. Brother Joshua and Will know about a few of them. We keep talking about and I never totally get them done. But... If you have, you know, we get a burden on your heart, let's, let's see if we can't put into action and, and reach some people. I think that we just got opportunities all around us uh, to, uh, to see people get saved, and, and who knows what could come from that. I, I, the lady I witnessed to yesterday, I was making a visit and walked out of the visit, and there she was in the waiting room. Uh, I just talked to, to her husband about needing to maybe set up a time where I could meet the wife, and, and then there she is, just right out the door, hello, and got to talk with her and share the gospel, and uh, we were praying the sinner's prayer, and somebody walked in the entryway, and she's, she kind of smiled, I'm like, oh, it's good for her to hear that, don't worry about it at all, that's great for that person to hear you praying, and, and just amazing, so wherever you're at, whatever we're doing, somebody uh, God could put in our way. <clears throat> this passage, it's recorded in... Um, Schofield's notes here, the Bible I use as his second miracle. And I know that Elisha uh, was able to part the water after Elijah was taken back to heaven. 
He picked up the mantle, and where's the Lord God of Elijah? And then uh, he knew that Elijah was gone, and the, the prophets were sending out search teams for Elijah. They can't find him. He's in heaven. You can't, can't locate him there. And then there's just a, just a small four-verse account, and it's right before one of my favorite stories in the Bible. We'll get to that some other time, but I love it when Elisha just gets after those kids for making fun of his bald head. Can somebody bald say amen to that? I just, that story just, I don't know, just does my heart good, right? But uh, anyway, in, in verse 19, this men of the city here at Jericho, th there's something wrong. And, and you can see that the city is pleasant. I know that uh, when Joshua conquered Jericho, there was uh, some curse about how it would never be rebuilt the same way and things of that nature. And some have thought that that, that might be what's going on here. But um, other scholars would say, well, that couldn't be, because if that was the case, then there's no way that anyone could heal it. Because if God put that uh, 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 prophecy on it, it's, he's not going to go against his word. I know this, that the men of the city, they, they've got a great city, but there's a water problem. We've had uh, buildings with water problems before. Uh, I guys tell you, just... just I, we walked in this building on Mother's Day when we were trying to move the chairs in. You remember that day, all the four inches of rain and trying to move from the other church, this church? And I was first or second one walk in, and I see water dripping from that ceiling fan. And I'm like, Lord, you've got to be kidding me. It hasn't leaked in here since we've been working. And the first day, we're, did you, is it me? Do I bring the leaks with me? I climbed up there and I put a bucket. I was trying to catch the water so it would stop leaking before we had church. I was like, can we get like a tarp up there? I don't want, oh, just the irony of it, you know. And we have a, a pleasant building, but we had a water problem. They have a pleasant town, but there's a water problem. The Bible says that the water is not in the ground barren. There's a problem there. Uh, one, uh, I believe it was John Gill, said that might have even been what the cause was for people drinking and then becoming barren. And the ladies were having uh, problems with child childbearing because of the water. And that's a serious issue. When you ain't got water, you got problems real quick. Water is not something you can go without. I know that in missionary works, uh, the the drilling wells is, is just a, a lifesaver for villages and a way to present the gospel when you can reach out, help people with their physical need, and then they're very, very open to, uh, to hear the spiritual need. We wanted to give away water at the fair one year, but they wouldn't let us because they're selling it across the street, so we couldn't you know, give ours away and be in competition with the vendors. <clears throat> but you know, give a cup of cold water or, or those things. People need that. This city, it's pleasant. The outside's fine, but when there's a water problem, you've got big problems. The water in Scripture is a picture of, of um, nations, of people, in Ephesians 5, it's a picture of the Word of God, the washing of the water by the Word. And you know, you can have a life that looks nice on the outside, looks pleasant from a distance. I mean, can, can have every uh, ability or pro, uh, pers uh, pr uh, potential to be exactly what it needs to be. But if you've got a water problem, you've got a Word of God problem, th there's a deep problem. You can look good on the outside, and, and the world may see a person say, oh, they got it all together. But if you've got a Word of God problem in that life, you won't go along without that uh, affecting everything else. The water of the city is the problem. And they came to Elisha, which is a wonderful strategy for anyone to go to a perceived prophet you got a problem, <clears throat> we, who, who's going to help it? I, I think that they knew that his mentor had a little experience of water. He could shut it off, and he could pray and turn it back on. Uh, they, these were plumbers, Will. I just thought about that. This is Will's favorite prophets in the whole Bible. They're plumbers, Elijah and Elisha. Elijah prayed, and no rain for three and a half years, and prayed again, and it comes right back on. So I wonder if they thought, hey, let's, let's ask the guy who has the same spirit. Maybe he can fix the water. If you have a problem with the Word of God, you probably ought to ask someone who knows about the Word of God. It's crazy to me to think the most important book of our existence 
people would suspect or, or suppose that they could just do it on their own without any influence or assistance. As we spoke this morning, the Bible is not um, prohibited for, for private reading and private study. You ought, to, you ought to read your Bible. You ought to study it yourself. And of all ages, we have so many access points for commentaries, for Bible studies, for videos. You can watch your favorite preacher every week somewhere. And it's amazing. You want to hear Rick Coram? You can tune him in. You can find somebody to, to explain a verse and explain uh, and get their commentary. We, it is so accessible, it's probably we're oversaturated in America with it. But you ought to go to the person or to the source that can fix the water. Elisha has a strange strategy for fixing the water. Look at verse 20. And he said, bring me a new cruise, put salt therein, and they brought it to him. Who would ever think putting salt in water is going to fix the water problem? <clears throat> People all around the world would love to figure out how to get salt out of the water to fix the water problem. If, if, if there were uh, a, a cheap or, or a technolo technology to do that, it would be worth more than oil to be able to take salt water and change it to fresh water. I've heard that Israel has some strategies and some technology like that. I don't know, and I haven't really studied up enough to talk very intelligently on it, so I just need to say um and shut my mouth right now. <laughs> but <clears throat> if you could, prospectively, the world's got plenty of water on top of it, but yet there's a lot of places, California right now, right? Uh, places where they're uh, rationing water and don't know how to fix it. And here Elisha says, bring me some salt, we're going to fix this spring. That's like me saying, bring me a football, we're going to fix this car. Bring me a wrench, I'm, I'm going to fix this, uh, I'm going to, well, I don't even know what I fix things with a wrench. I mean, you know, uh, bring, bring me a drill, I'm going to fix your glass mirror here, okay? Uh, that, this is the opposite strategy that should be used to solve a water problem. And you know, it just brought to my mind that there's a lot of examples in Scripture where God tells us to do the opposite thing of what we naturally would think that would solve the problem. God says, do the opposite. You got an enemy? Yeah, I can't wait to fight him. God says, bless your enemies. Pray for them that despitefully use you. What? what, what? No, that's my enemy. I'm, I pray for my friends. I pray for my family. No, God says... Bless your enemies. Pray for them. Well, that doesn't make sense, Lord. Exactly. Because your ways are not my ways, and your thoughts are not my thoughts, saith the Lord. There's just some examples in the Scripture that are like opposites or, or paradox of, of strategy. And I don't know if it's just to make the point that Elisha was a man of God and it was going to be God's miracle. It wasn't like he dug deeper and found the spring and, oh, you just got to dig over here and that's just a natural problem and a natural fix. He was not a literal plumber, amen. He, he was a prophet. It wasn't just something that could carnally get fixed in this city. And in people's lives, oftentimes it's not something that we can just fix with a worldly wisdom. I don't know what the statistics are, but there's a lot of worldly counselors employed around our country right now. And not, not saying that people don't need help, but I'm saying that I think we need more of this help than anything else. A lot of the circumstances we suffer with are consequences of sin that would be fixed if we would just turn and get righteous rather than, than um, uh, have, have uh, renewed counseling and those things. And I, I'm not against listening and helping and trying to give people wisdom. Uh, that, that's that's the, uh, the ministry of the church, is to edify the believer, to build up those. But the, but the strategy and the source is definitely different. Elisha said, <clears throat> bring me a cruise, a new cruise, and put salt therein. And he went forth unto the spring of the waters and cast the salt in there. How is that going to fix anything? That just... That's like marching around the walls of Jericho seven times and, and expecting the walls to come down. How's that going to bring down the walls? Maybe Jericho was used to stories like this in their, in their history. <clears throat> used to 
just obeying God and seeing him do something that only he can do. I really think that in our Christian life, we ought to expect God to come through when we obey and put his principles to practice. Elisha uses salt and throws it in. And then look at verse 21. It says, and he said, thus saith the Lord. This was not something he did on his own behalf or his own mind or his own idea. He had the word of the Lord, and he was confident enough to claim he had the word of the Lord. That's, that's a big statement in itself. For a prophet to just make up, ah, the Lord said this, and really not, would be dangerous, dangerous dealings for a prophet's well-being. But he had the word of the Lord, and God told him to put salt in it. Can I show you a few verses where God tells us to do things that are just totally opposite of what you would think would fix something? Go to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, and let's start in verse number 23. He said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Look at verse 25. For what is a man advantageth, advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself, or be cast away? For whosoever shall be Ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. This verse tells us if you want to find life, you've got to lose it. The message of the world and, and of all the marketing strategies is have it your way, get what you want, <clears throat> have your best day now. The message of God's word is take up your cross be willing to sacrifice your life for my sake and my work, and then you'll find it. So i got to lose it in order to find it? Now, I've lost keys all over this place already, and uh, praise the Lord. Uh, um, my wife uh, got me, oh, I'm so excited. Apple tags, yes, I can find my keys. And, and she was so excited, she gave it to me a week ahead of Father's Day. She thought Father's Day was last Sunday. I'm like, yeah, it's probably three Sundays ago, babe. Just go ahead and give me a... I lose things all the time, and sometimes I've lost things and found other things looking for those things. You ever do that? You're looking for one thing, you're like, oh, I'm glad I was looking, I found this. Praise the Lord. You lose your life, and you're going to find it for Christ's sake. Find a place in the service of God where you can just lose your time. Find a place, for God's sake, you can just lose some of your treasure. Find a place, for the Lord Jesus' sake, that you can lose, and then you'll really find. It's the opposite. How can you put salt in water and expect that to fix the water? That's not going to fix water to drink. That's going to make it brackish and, and worse. I just read that word in a commentary. I really have no idea what it means. I just don't do a salt water. <laughs> thought I'd try it out on you. <clears throat> You, you, you don't put salt in water to fix it. Yeah, but sometimes you do the opposite carnal thing so that you can receive the spiritual end. Look at another verse in Luke. Uh, go to Luke chapter um, 17, verse 33. Another salt reference. Verse 32, remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. <clears throat> not, not just a one-hit wonder, that, that thought of losing your own life to find it. It's in Luke 9 and Luke 17. Then go, go to John 12, and it's in other Gospels as well, but look at John 12 with me. Just this opposite strategy. John chapter 12. Verse 
Verse 23, And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. <clears throat> if you serve, you get honor. That's the principle. Well, I want honor and then I'll serve. No, 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 no. That's, that's the opposite strategy. That's the world is, well, you did something good for me. I'll do something good for you. No, this is serve, and then the, uh, the Father will honor. I mentioned this one in Matthew already. We go to Matthew 5, 44. I would rather have the testimony of that verse that says that even uh, a man's enemies will be at peace with him when they're, when they're right with the Lord. <clears throat> but sometimes an enemy, you just have them. They, 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 they can... Maybe eventually be your friend, but there can be foes and workplace and families even and, and churches and those things. But verse 44 says, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Boy, if there ought to be any place that we could practice this, even in, even in the church house, when there's someone that you think, wow, they just don't like me. Bless them. Be, do the opposite of what you think. Well, they don't like me. I'm just going to avoid them. You're crazy, man. You're in church. Let's do it Jesus' way. Let's bless everybody. Even if you, you might be wrong, and, and if you start getting blessed, maybe you'll know that everybody thinks you're their enemy, right, after tonight's sermon. But <clears throat> I want to bless you. Really? I didn't know I was your enemy. Well, okay. but Bless them. Do the opposite. It's, it's, it doesn't make sense carnally. Why would you put salt in the spring, Elisha? Because it's the word of the Lord. Are you confident about Matthew 5.44? Will somebody say amen? I'm very confident about Matthew 5.44. I'm just as confident as Matthew 5.44 as Elisha was in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse whatever it was. It wasn't written when he said it. Ours is written. We have a more sure word of prophecy. <clears throat> Put it to the test. Look at Luke chapter 6. Look at this one. Lose life to find it. Bless enemies. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give, and it shall be what? Given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall men give unto your bosom, for with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. The verses in front of that, <coughs> equally uh, uh, wise. Do good and lend, in verse 35, hoping for nothing again. Are you kidding me? Lend and don't hope for anything back? And your reward shall be great. You shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Boy, that is opposite of any Baptist theology and practicality that I know of. Well, they did it to me. I'm not going to do it. To th 36. Be therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be... They're just opposite of the carnal, worldly, can I say this, sometimes Christian attitudes that you find. It's like once someone does you wrong, all Christianity is thrown aside. Now we're back in the real world, real, real world preacher. They did this to me, so now spirituality is, is finished. The Bible's never finished. Boy, we got a great looking town, but there's something wrong with the water. Something wrong with the source that's inside. Wow, it's a, it's a great looking Christian, but don't do them wrong or then you'll get the, the, the wrong end of them. What? When do we get to stop being merciful? Stop forgiving? I don't know about you, but whenever I've had a money problem, it's usually because of my giving problem. 
And I just figure if I'm low on the getting, I ought to get higher on the giving. Well, that don't make sense. You, you got to be tight. No, not, not the way I see it. Give and it shall be given unto you. It's the opposite of what you think you would do to fix the problem. Oh, preacher, I just, it's uh, really tight. Hey, I know what the Bible says, Luke, Luke 6, 38. Look at James chapter 4, verse number 10. James chapter 4. Let's start in verse 6. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, <clears throat> resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall what? How do I get higher? Get lower. How do I get a better position? Get a lower position. Well, I want to I do something great in the kingdom. Then minister and do something low right now. Well, I want to reign with Christ. Well, then suffer with him right now. I want to suffer. Well, how are you going to reign? It's the opposite. We got a water problem. Put some salt in it. No, that won't fix it. We're trying to get the salt out of it so we can drink it. No, do what I said. That will fix it. Give in order to get. Bless in order to win the war. Lose life in order to find it. Be humble in order to be lifted up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. Well, you never thought you were judging the law when you start speaking about other people in their, their evil ways, but that's what the book says. <clears throat> then Romans chapter 4, one more. Romans chapter 4. I like this one. So many people think that in order to gain with God, they got to do for God. If I'm going to get to heaven, I got to do more to get there. I've got to get these righteous things in my life, and, and nothing wrong with righteousness, but look at Romans chapter 4, verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Look at verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the... What's the next word? He don't justify the godly, he justifies the ungodly. <coughs> His faith is counted for righteousness. Isn't that just the opposite of logic that you're not going to work so that you can go to heaven? Well, I want to get to heaven. Well, you got to work hard. No, that's the opposite of truth. You don't have to work at all to go to heaven. Jesus did the work. You've got to accept it, believe, and then that's counted for your righteousness. Hallelujah. What a, what a great deal. That makes absolutely no logical, carnal sense. Probably the reason why it takes the faith of a child to be able to go in the kingdom and those that are wise in their own eyes and righteous in their own ways will never be justified. It goes on back. It's not just a New Testament thing. Look at verse 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness. What's the last two words say? Without works. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Those are quotations from the book of Psalms. The same Holy Spirit was telling them back there. 
you're not getting there by the lambs that you offer at Passover time. You're not going because of the offerings and the, and the, the Sabbaths that you're keeping. You're going to go because the Lord's given you righteousness. Boy, it makes coming to church just so liberating and free because I'm not coming because I have to. I'm coming because I want to. You know when your kids are nice when they want something? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you know. And they're all, they can just, I mean, they can just lay it on thick when there's something, some jackpot or some, some, uh, 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 something at the end of, of, of the, the, the deal. And you're like, mm-hmm, yeah, you really love me. I know you. Oh, Daddy, I love you so much. But then there's those times when there's nothing offered. And you're like, man, that is precious there. That's good. God doesn't need anything from us, but he wants everything from us. God doesn't need your heart, but he wants it. God doesn't have to have your faith, but he is pleasing to him. Just see this short little passage in Kings and <clears throat> just a reminder to me that the word of God doesn't have to make sense worldly to work. The word of God, in fact, probably won't make sense in this life to work. I love when Josh Bevan says, I came to Xenia to tell people that they're in sin and they're wicked and they're lost and they're going to hell. And that's going to draw them to start coming to my church. That's my strategy. I'm going to tell them that they are undone and they are not right with God. And I'm going to keep preaching that. And then God will build his church through that negative confrontation of God's law. It just don't make much sense, does it? We can offer kindness and love and we can give, but the real message that we give is you need Jesus. And the only way you get him is not working for it, but just be willing to receive him. Amen. And he's already done the work. These men of the city came to Elisha again, and they said, Hey, see the city? It's pleasant. Verse 21, He went forth into the spring of waters and cast the salt in there and said, Thus saith the Lord, I've healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake. Can I just remind you that there was a woman at the well trying to draw water? And, and Jesus was there too, and they didn't have anything to draw it with. And, and he said, the water I'll give you springs up unto life everlasting. You'll never thirst again. Give me that water. I want that water. Oh, when you get the water of eternal life, you'll never need another drop of it. It springs forth eternal life, everlasting life. Boy, I'm thankful that, that uh, I, I was raised around this, this uh, Bible the correct way with that thought of eternal security. I know some folks grew up differently and had pressed upon them that they were Holding on to Jesus. Bill Dwight tells that testimony all the time. He said, I always thought I was holding on to Jesus, and I found out he's the one holding on to me. What a blessing to figure that out. We got eternal life because the water's been healed. It's been made uh, uh, palatable. I made up that word about there, too. It, 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 it's, it's fixed. There's no more death in 2 Kings chapter 2 for that city. There's no more barren land. The waters were healed unto this day. Oh, praise the Lord. I got one dose of salvation. And that's all I needed for the rest of my, my life. I don't need to be resaved. I, I don't need to, to uh, be uh, uh, made whole again. Jesus fixed me the first time and gave me life everlasting. It springs up inside. The Bible tells us we're the salt of the earth, doesn't it? And we just be thrown out into these different cisterns and these different springs. Salt in their water? Yeah, it'll make a difference. It'll make them pure. 
just so neat. I'm praying for a family. I hope they get saved. And, and uh, the other day the person said, see, I've been talking better around you, preacher. You're already having an effect on me. Uh, if, it, if it does, that's great. But we want the water to be fixed. Amen? We want life flowing, eternal life to happen in people's hearts. What a great, what a great calling that we have as Christians. Have you ever thought about that? We get to tell people of the best thing in the world, and it's free. You don't have to sell it. It's already been paid for. What a salesman's dream. Jesus doesn't have to be sold. He just has to be told. And people will find the water will be healed. Elisha's second miracle, salt strategy. I'm wondering how much salt we're going to need in this parking lot. Amen. And uh, I'm, I'm praying for no snow on Sundays already. Okay. We're in July, but we ought to start praying for it. But salt fixes a lot of things, doesn't it? It'll melt through a cold heart. It'll season up some food that might not taste uh, good on its own. And it'll preserve something way longer than it would be preserved. And that's what we're called to be. I think that once the rapture takes place, this earth is going to be saltless and there'll be no preservation from the putrefaction of wickedness and the evil one will be totally unrestrained and unrestricted to carry out havoc in this world. You may not realize how important you are in your family, in your circle of friends, or in your, your employment, and the people you're around. You are salt that helps purify pur purify and preserve the area that you're in. Bible Baptist Church, we're important in Marysville. They might not realize it, they might not know it, but there needs to be a church that preaches the gospel that's seen all around. People need to know, and I pray that God would use us until he's going to call us home. And if there's ever a time when our water is the problem, it's because we've shut it off because the water is not the problem. It is pure and it will do its job. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, thank you for the word tonight. <clears throat> Lord, thank you for the reminder that I'm not called to have the wisdom of this world, and I'm not to lay up treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but I'm, I'm told to lay up treasures in heaven. God, I pray that that eternal view and that focus would continually to be revealed and, and reminded of in my mind and reviewed. God, I, I'm, I'm human and frail, and my eyes are prone to wonder and to um, long for the things of this world.